First of all, thank you. I'll be stumbling around. I've never done this before, so I'm going to hit you off with it. I'm Don Thomas from uh, Thomas Industrial Coatings, which is Peabody, Missouri, which is Jeff County. Um, let me give you a little background of us. I started in 1979 as a, uh, an apprentice, pre-apprentice, worked my way through the system. So that went from uh, apprentice to journeyman to foreman, back to journeyman, back to apprentice, and bounced all around because I couldn't keep my line of thought. So eventually now we end up for being here today, and I'm the owner of the company. I choose to be union. The men that, and women that work for me choose to do that. Uh, with that being said, the bulk of our work is public. We uh, started in 1991 at a, basically a million dollars. We've grown the company to $55 million. We have over 200 employees in the field. I touch every sector of Missouri there is. I've worked in every county. I have grandfathers, sons, dads that work for me. Uh, my recruiting system starts at the local high schools, and that's whether it's in Herculaneum, Dunklin R5, or whether I go to Vandalia, you, you name it, that's where we get our people from. The average age is about, that have been with the company is about 12 years. They average about $60,000 a piece. Um, they do work in various counties and states throughout the U.S., which is part of what we're trying to do. I mean, you create your work staff so they have a great livelihood and they can feed their families. Um, our core people homeschool. They also have the regular public system they use and they have the private system they use. I run what I consider a very professional industrial painting company, which is not limited to bridges, water tires, lock and dams, barges, bridges, wastewater treatment plants, water treatment, and the story goes on and on. Tim Klotz already referred to it later. But what we really do is we maintain and maintenance the infrastructure of America. That's what our goal is. And when I say maintain, that's a, that's a value that I have to sell to the customer because we are doing maintenance on that, but that maintainment is by building the containments or educating the people we're working on or saving the traveling public or the employees themselves with training. And then we might blast off, but if we blast off lead, it's gotta be in the engineered uh, system. And then we have dust collection, we have recycling systems, and it goes on down the path of the safety. So at the end of the day, maintenance creates a value for the customer. And our customers are, we would think, are our number one assets, which is not true. It starts with, we have tons of assets, which is our bankers, our attorneys, and uh, insurance people and goes on down through but there's two people you need at the end of the day you need customers and you need somebody to do the work the customers we have to sell to them value and the value is is if I maintain what you have by creating maintenance on that what am I giving you back well I'm not building new I'm maintaining something that gives you longevity so if I can add five years to ten years or whatever I may add because there's a system in place it takes a professional person to be able to do that with the assets that we have of our folks that work for us, which reaches far past the individual, it's about if they get in their vehicle and they take lead home with them and feed to their wife that's now pregnant, that's going to have a baby, and the story goes on and on and on. We know what that does. So our job is to create that the lead stays at the job site. Or that the um, things that we create for them that we're making sure their livelihoods go on so they don't get to the age of 50 and then they're no longer around to provide for their family. I would like to think that uh, as prof professional people that are to be qualified safety trained craftsmen see that this is not just a job but it's a career and that's why I use the average of 12 years. I've got over 100 guys from my local high school that have ne never worked for anyone else but Thomas Industrial Coatings. And what I normally do is I take two or three and recruit them in, put them in the apprentice program and work them through. And their dream is, is to one day become like I have. They start with by being a apprentice, to being a journeyman, to being a supervisor and work their way up the ladder. And then they want to eventually do what? Dream the dreamer's dream and that's on their own company. And I think we shouldn't restrict them by saying it's not okay to make the money that's available out there. I spent a career getting to, to here and I had to take a path uh, that's not always been the easiest one, but if, if we don't have goals in mind uh, to say that someone's there, I'll just take your spot, that's not true because 
Right now there is a labor shortage in America, not just in Missouri, it's everywhere. And what we're trying to do is create a path to how do we get a hold of them besides the educational system, which everybody's dream is to go to college. Well, that's for most folks. But there's other people out there that is in different areas that need the help of us to create jobs for them. But that's not to create jobs so they can give away others and then uh, and make minimal wage or make a lesser wage. So I'll get back to where I'm supposed to be. And I think that the bottom line is there, there is we're dealing with real people's lives and there, this is a journey and a way of life for the people that work for us in the industrial painting field. There should be no shortcuts allowed. Uh, maintaining something actually means creating maintenance on it, on a structure which you're creating value and giving you more life, especially in that particular structure. We have to, as an industrial painting contractor, we have to uh, announce ourselves and, and stay in line with uh, and I'm going to give some acronyms, but it's just part of it. SSPC, which makes guidelines for the work being done. Then we have NACE, which is the inspection or the quality assurance, quality control role. Then we have OSHA to abide by. Then we have the DNR, EPA, and EMR rating, and the list goes on and on. So I, I know you guys get the picture. So it's just not anybody cannot just do what we do without some form of training. I guess the training might be limited to what you feel is necessary, but there is all the protocols that have to come with it. It's not just a laundry list. It's something that's real, that if we don't pay attention to, we'll have more deaths the, and, and falls. The number one thing that we train on is the number one thing is that OSHA cites, which is fall protection. The next behind that is slip hazards. Then you've got lead uh, poisoning, which is in the top 10. And then you, like Tim said, I'll repeat a little bit, but you've got confined space, respiratory, emergency action, air monitoring, lead worker, supervisor, and just the list goes on. So you can't just show up on these jobs and say, I'm going to maintain something. There's a program that has to be with that. Any questions? Representative White. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I listened to your testimony, and I believe you're very sincere about what you said. I think you probably, you're a business, the business owner, uh, you came up through the union ranks and you're a union shop. I would get the impression from your testimony, if your guys decided to decertify, you would do the same level, you, you would expect the same level of safety, you would provide them the same level of training, whether you're a union shop or not. You, you wouldn't want, as a business owner, to not handle lead safety. You wouldn't want to not, you know, I, I, we, we're crossing this union, the union issue really is a little separate from prevailing wage. It's a, one's a payment scale, the other's a labor organization thing, but to me, I know contractors that do both union and non-union, some of them are owners that have multiple shops. I don't think that if you do your line of work, you're going to do your line of work in such a way that you don't want to get the expense of lawsuits, you don't want to get the expense of injuries, and you care about your workers. Correct. And I, I don't see that, the, the, well, gee, okay, this is a non-prevailing wage payment now, so I'm going to forget all that stuff. I don't think you would personally forget that. If you're you're doing, if you had a job that you did that was non-prevailing wage, I would assume you're going to do the same thing. You're going to want the same safety, the same things as as your you would, whether it's prevailing wage or not. Yes, I have a moral obligation. And I, I, I believe that, sir. And I'm not I'm not picking on you at all. I, no, I, I, I think that people separating the union side apart. A, con a good contractor is going to do that whether they're union or not union. Correct. And uh, I know you know there's different training programs. The union has excellent training programs. They have a nice structured training program. Our electric guys and their thing have shown me their stuff down there. We there are counterparts. Sometimes it, it, with a small shop, it might be you're the, you're an on the job apprentice for five ten years before the guy's going to allow you to do things more than you know helping him do something if it's a very small shop. But, I, I don't, I, I've heard on some of the questions the safety, that safety is going to go away if we drop prevailing wage. I think that it, that is incumbent on our, the people doing the employee and the people doing the work. Well, for instance, on the union side of things, there's approximately about 18 certificates they can have, but to work for Thomas Industrial, there's 32. Okay. So I do 14 on my own that's required okay. by my company. If, if you if, doing if we read the laws and how, according to what structure we are and what we're doing, we didn't invent the 14, or following the 14. If you had a scenario with Boeing, I'm just throwing a number, I have no clue if they do it, and you needed to do some, they needed the same kind of services you do for bridges and water tanks and whatnot, 
you would do, and that would not be a prevailing wage job, you would do the same, it wouldn't change your mode of operation to be less safe if it were not a prevailing wage job. Correct. And that, that so, and I, I do appreciate the safety issues. And that's why I mentioned the EMR, because right. the EMR is driven, we know what EMR is driven by, so. The uh, EMR, for instance, in my company, is 0.55. So uh, 0.55 is perfect. So uh, in 2006, I had three deaths. And I was a union contractor in 2006, and, and those things come, so we, we've been on the bad side of things, too. Right. So, and I'm not trying to boast on the union either way. I'm looking at what I'm really looking at is some key words, and that is we're trying to decide if maintenance on something is cost effective maintaining it. Should we lower the cost? To get more people involved because that's what's going to happen to get better more jobs i don't believe any of that side of it i think you're trying to restore something to give value to it and to bring value you have to have something to bring value with okay. your, your argument thing is kind of that if we expand the, the number of businesses that would be doing this your concern is the safety that those new businesses might acquire kind of that they wouldn't do as good a job as you're doing <coughs> Because if, if they're, if I would just want to be held accountable for what they're supposed to do. And but wouldn't they be held accountable by the same standards you are? If if you're going to do that bridge, whether it's a union non, if prevailing wage, if prevailing wage were to shift and go away on this job, they still would have the same standards. The still same requirements for EPA for lead and for the enclosure. And, I mean, it, it is. I I understand it's not me painting a room or a janitor painting a room at school. You you guys do very specialized work. But whether you're, regardless of how you're getting paid or your labor organization, you're still going to be bound by all those DNR and EPA and those things, let alone, and then again, your own internal responsibilities for safety and training of the guys that you, and gals that you're putting on those jobs. Correct, and the goal was really to have you see that it's not just painting a room. Right, and that, you got that far. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can I see the hands of any others that are testifying for this bill? Okay, and those testifying against? Uh, Representative Frame, you are now using Richard Craighead's time. I'll be very quick. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I, I want to congratulate you on your decision where to locate your facility. I think you're in God's country over there in Jefferson County, and Amen. please don't leave. Um, are you a member of the chamber? Uh, we had the chamber lobbyist here earlier. I didn't know what he may think of your testimony, but you're a business owner. What do you think of the chamber's uh, position on the particular issue? Were you here when he testified? You may have missed it. I'm sorry. I was here, but let's say I'm not here for that part. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Appreciate that.